And concluding uh, our first session on chest radiographs uh, will be Dr. Mark Parker from uh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, who's going to review for us the heart and pericardium. I know we've asked him to do the impossible, cover this topic in 15 minutes, uh, but I think there's no one more capable. Thanks, Carolyn. So let's talk about the heart and pericardium and conventional chest radiography. And in particular, we'll review normal cardiac chambers in both the frontal and lateral radiograph, discuss specific causes for cardiac chamber enlargement, describe the location of the various cardiac valves, and briefly talk about the normal pericardium and pericardial effusions on chest radiographs. Now, the heart and its major blood vessels occupy the middle mediastinal compartment in the central portion of the radiograph or thoracic cavity. And it creates a uniform opacity such that its contours and borders are readily differentiated from the adjacent radiolucent lung. And we refer to this radio opacity as the cardiomediastinal silhouette. Now, this normal cardiomediastinal silhouette occupies less than 50% of the total volume of the thorax. So we look at the size of the cardiac mediastinal silhouette relative to the rest of the thorax, we refer to this as a cardiothoracic ratio. And the normal cardiothoracic ratio ranges between less than 0.42, or I should say less than or equal to 0.42 to 0 0.50. Now most often with hospitalized patients and ICU patients, we're gonna be dealing with patients that have a big cardiothoracic ratio. But on occasion, you're gonna encounter a patient that actually has a very small cardiothoracic ratio. Now, that ratio is less than 0.42. We actually have a diagnosis of an entity called microcardia that we come across occasionally. And you need to know the differential diagnosis for microcardia. And it includes entities such as adrenal insufficiency, malnutrition, various cachectic or wasting syndromes, anorexia, bulimia, constricted pericarditis, and hypovolemia. And actually, depending upon the relative size of the donor heart to the recipient thorax, you can even see microcardia in the setting of an orthotopic heart transplant. But again, most of our hospitalized patients, and especially those from the ICUs, are going to have abnormally large cardiothoracic ratios, greater than 50%. What causes a big cardiothoracic ratio? Cardiomegaly, cardiomyopathies, cardiac decompensation, heart failure, and of course, pericardial effusions. Now, if we look at a standard chest x-ray and draw a plumb line straight down the thoracic spine, you'll notice that about two-thirds of the myocardium actually extends to the left of that plumb line, as illustrated by line B. And about one-third of it extends to the right of that line, as illustrated by line A. You also notice on the right side of the cardiomyostinal silhouette, we have two segments. The upper segment is nearly vertical, highlighted in red here, and it's created by the superior vena cava. The lower segment is outwardly convex and forms a lateral border of the right atrium. Now along the left side of carmistinal silhouette, we actually have four segments or bumps or moguls. The biggest one is this big red structure right here, which is the aortic knob or transverse aorta. Just below that, we have a smaller focal convexity created by the main pulmonary artery or left pulmonary artery segment. And then the third smaller segment is usually flat or somewhat concave, created by the left atrial appendage. And then the lower segment is laterally convex and forms a lateral margin of the silhouette, and most of that is created by the left ventricular chamber. Now, knowledge of the size, shape, and morphology of these various chambers is very helpful for us to recognize a single or pan chamber enlargement on a chest radiograph when presented as such, as in the case before you. Our anterior cardiovascular structures, if we correlate this illustration here with our radiograph, we can see the upper border here is created by the ascending aorta and transverse aorta. And then just below that, we come into the pulmonary outflow tract. And below that, I'm sorry, I skipped a segment, the ascending aorta. Then we have the pulmonary artery and then the right ventricular outflow tract. And then we feed into the right ventricle. Now notice the right ventricle actually comes all the way down and touches the diaphragm and occupies the inferior one-third of the sternum. If you look at the space behind the sternum, the upper two-thirds is lucent and the inferior one-third is opaque. That's a normal relationship of the myocardium to this retrosternal clear space. Now, if you look posteriorly, the upper posterior border or the superior posterior border is created by the left atrium and the inferior border is created by the left ventricle. And this space between the myocardium and the spine is referred to as the retrocardiac clear space. 
And once again, knowledge of the size, shape, morphologies of these various chambers is very helpful for us to recognize either single or multi-chamber enlargement on a lateral chest radiograph when presented as such, such as seen here. So what makes the heart become too big? Well, anything that makes it work too hard. So this increased workload on the myocardium will begin with dilatation of a single chamber. And eventually that dilatation will preceded by hypertrophy of that chamber. And eventually that chamber will only hypertrophy this so far, it can't hypertrophy any longer, and that chamber will fail. When that chamber fails, then another chamber starts to dilate. And it'll dilate hypertrophy to a certain point where it can't hypertrophy any longer, and then that chamber fails. And eventually all chambers fail and the heart decompensates. But even the setting of pan chamber failure and pan chamber enlargement, if you scrutinize that lateral radiograph, that frontal radiograph, you'll see that a single or double chamber will predominate the radiographic picture. When the heart fails, we'll see classic radiographic evidence of heart flare. If you correlate this illustration here with the, the frontal radiograph, you see the cardiothoracic ratio will be enlarged, greater than 50%. The vascular pedicle, the azygous vein, and the central vessels will become engorged. We'll see cephalization of blood flow. We'll see a parahyalar haze created by engorgement of the vessels and oozing a fluid into the alveoli. We'll see curly B lines, or these short perpendicular lines reading out to pleural space, reflective of interstitial edema. And with increasing heart failure, we may actually see blunting of these sharp sulci as pleural effusions form. Now, the myocardium might also enlarge if it's been insulted by various toxins, be it from an adenovirus or some other viral infection, or various chemotherapeutic agents, which make that muscle become weakened. In that scenario, the myocardium may become generalized, uniformly enlarged, giving rise to a globular configuration, as is seen in this patient with a chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. And eventually, this patient may develop heart failure and have a very similar picture to what we just showed. So now, let's look at some specific chambers that enlarge what they look like and as to why they enlarge. Now let's begin with the left ventricle. Now remember the left ventricle creates the left heart border on our frontal radiographs and is located posteriorly and inferiorly on our lateral graphs. Now the myocardium actually can enlarge quite a bit in that left ventricular chamber hypertrophy quite a bit, but not actually enlarge in your chest x-ray. But what you may actually notice are changes in contour morphology in that x-ray. So why does the left ventricle enlarge? Well, we most often see marked enlargement in the setting of hypertension aortic insufficiency, and cardiomyopathies. What else might make it enlarge? Basically anything that makes that chamber work too hard to get the blood out, or is overloading that chamber. So entities like aortic stenosis, coarctation, atherosclerotic vascular disease, mitral insufficiency, various intra and extracardiac shunts, and hyperthyroidism. What does it look like? Again, it may not actually enlarge, but it'll change its contour morphology. So one of the first times we'll actually see is the elongation of the left ventricle on our frontal radiograph along the expected axis of blood ejection from the apex to the aortic root. That chamber elongates. It may hypertrophy and develop rounding of the left ventricular chamber. And with progressive enlargement, that left ventricle actually may hypertrophy so much that it projects downward and the cardiac apex may lay along the diaphragm and even push below the diaphragm and the gastric fundus. And there's a patient here with marked left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, what does it look like on the lateral examination? Well, if you go back to that retrocardiac clear space between the posterior wall of the myocardium and the anterior margin of the spine, illustrating gold here, that space fills in as that left ventricular chamber enlarges and encroaches upon the spine. We may see a so called Hoffman Wrigler sign, where the distance between the posterior wall of the left ventricular chamber extends more than 1.8 centimeters beyond the line where we draw an intersection between the diaphragm and the inferior cava. Classic sign of LVH on your lateral radiograph. Now, when we're looking at the left heart on our frontal radiographs, and we're looking for whether that chamber is enlarged or not, don't forget to look for focal contour changes, because not always, always just worried about hypertrophy that chamber, but maybe some type of other insult to the myocardium. And if we notice in this case, this patient actually has a focal contour bulge in the left ventricle. So we're not going to be thinking about LVH in this case. We're going to be thinking about some other insult that's more ominous. When you see this, think about a post-infarction, myocardial infarction, and with the formation of a ventricular pseudoaneurysm. And recommend the patient get a CTA examination or an MRI. Here's the coronal white blood image, which is equivalent to our frontal radiograph. And you see the contour change here created by the post-infarct pseudoaneurysm. And on our three-chamber view, RV, LV, alpha tract, we see the pseudoaneurysm protruding back here posteriorly. 
You want to recognize this in your radiograph, get the patient referred appropriately because these are at very high risk for rupture and death if not treated. All right, let's move to the right ventricle. The right ventricle does not really contribute a whole lot to the cardiac silhouette on our frontal radiograph because remember it lies anteriorly plastered up against the sternum. What makes the RV enlarge? Basically, anything that makes it work too hard or overloads that chamber. So pulmonary hypertension, pulmonic valvular and fundibular stenosis, mitral valve disease, trunk arteriosis, and various septal defects. What does it look like? Well, in the frontal examination, we'll actually see uplifting of that apex and lateral view as the myocardium actually assumes what's referred to as a boot-shaped heart or color and so bow shaped heart, classing with tetralogy of flow. On the lateral examination, we lose that one-third opaque, two-thirds lucent relationship between, um, behind the sternum as the RV enlarges and encroaches upon that retrosternal clear space as this patient with core pulmonality. The right atrium normally creates the vast majority of the right heart border on our frontal radiograph. Now, slight enlargement can actually be difficult to recognize and is not going to be appreciated in a lateral view because it's superimposed upon these other cardiac chambers. What makes the right atrium enlarge? Atrial self defects, tricuspid stenosis, tricuspid insufficiency, and right ventricular failure. What does that look like? Well, if you look at that normal right heart border and that one third of the myocardium retreating to the right of the spine, we'll see it becomes outwardly more and more laterally convex as class is treated in these two patients with Epstein's anomaly, but may be seen in other forms of right heart disease and tricuspid disease as well. Again, we're not gonna really appreciate this in a lateral examination because of the superimposition of the cardiac chambers. And lastly, the left atrium. The left atrium lies posteriorly and does not really contribute to a whole lot of our cardiac silhouette on the frontal radiograph. Remember, it makes up the posterior and superior border of the myocardium on our lateral examination. Now, why does the left atrium enlarge? Well, in the previous antibiotic area, it was most often due to rheumatic valvular disease. Now we most often see it as a result of various right to left shunts, left ventricular failure, and various cardiomyopathies. Left atrial enlargement is going to be responsible for a whole host of radiologic signs you're going to hear throughout your entire residency training program and well into your career. One of the earliest signs we'll see is actually in a barium swallow examination, where if you look at the contrast filled barium column, it's going to be displaced posteriorly and rightward just at the level of the crina and just below the crina. If you remember that the left atrial appendage is normally concave or a straight line, as it enlarges in left atrial disease, it'll start protruding beyond the margin of the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery, but aggressive enlargement actually becomes fully convex and extends even further beyond the left ventricular margin and the pulmonary artery. It can compressively enlarge until it actually starts now protruding into the right lung and protrudes against the aerated right lung, creating a so-called double density sign, another sign of left atrial enlargement. If we apply Higgins' rule and we draw a line along the inferior margin left main stem bronchus to the outer margin at double density, if it's over seven centimeters in length, it's indicative of left atrial enlargement. And on the frontal examination with aggressive enlargement, we actually may see splaying the normal crinal angle as it splays out wider and wider, creating a so-called wishbone sign. If you're from Texas, some people refer to us as a bow-legged cowboy sign. And what's it look like in the lateral examination? Well, we'll see posterior displacement of the left main bronchus so that it no over long, longer overlaps the right main stem bronchus. And the left and right bronchus now appears in an inverted V and that mimics the legs of a walking man. And this is referred to as a walking man sign, indicative of a left atrial enlargement. Notice how the upper posterior border of the myocardium is enlarged here from the left atrial disease. Now, knowledge of the location of the various cardiac chambers allows you to know where the various cardiac valves are located. So kind of burn this illustration into your mind and realize that the normal cardiac valves are not going to be receptive on your radiograph. But the valves may become visible when diseased, which would be manifest by calcifications, or when iatrogenic replaced. So it's helpful for you to know where the valves live so you can recognize those type of pathologies or if they've been replaced. Draw an X right across your mediastinum. And then superimpose your four valves. The valve dead center, illustrated in blue here, on top of the spine is going to be the aortic valve. If you go out toward the left hilum, the green valve will represent the pulmonic valve. If we overlie the left heart, the pink valve represents the mitral valve. And if we overlie the right heart, the yellow valve represents the tricuspid valve. If you like mnemonics, remember things. Remember P A M T, PAM T, and how the valves also zigzag off and on, off and on the spine. 
So this patient actually had four valves replaced. Okay, the yellow valve here, tricuspid, the pink valve, mitral, the blue valve on top of the spine here, the aortic, and the green valve here, the pulmonic valve. And lastly, the pericardium. The pericardium is a closed endothelial sac that envelops the heart and the proximal great vessels. It's comprised of an outer fibrous layer and then two inner serous layers that actually have a potential space that houses the pericardial fluid, which normally contains about 50 milliliters or less of fluid. This is transitive and not typically perceptible on your radiograph. Now here's a coronal CT image of a patient with a beautiful pericardial fusion. We can see that the uh, visceral and the serous parietal pericardial layers are separated by the pericardial fluid enveloping the myocardium here. One thing to really remember and burn this image in your mind is that whether it's fluid or air in the pericardial sac, if it's in the pericardial sac, it's not going to extend more cephalad than the proximal extent of the pericardial flexion's attachment on the vascular pedicle. And it's nice to illustrate in this patient, they actually had a radiofrequency ablation therapy complicated by a esophageal pericardial fistula. You can see the barium column here as he swallows the barium and it spills out freely into the pericardial sac. And we can see the barium outlines the myocardium as a halo of fluid around the myocardium, but it does not extend above the attachment of the pericardial flexions at the vascular pedicle. And if you keep this image in mind, whether it's air in the pericardial sac or fluid in the pericardial sac, you'll be able to differentiate that from pneumomediastinum, which sometimes becomes a problem on our radiographs. So on the frontal radiograph, it takes a fair amount of fluid to really start changing the morphology of the cardiac So what on the order of about 400 to 500 milliliters. When it starts accumulating, we'll see initially an increase in the transverse diameter in fairly, and the cardiothoracic ratio will increase. But our cardiophrenic angles will remain sharp. We'll see no increase in the vertical length or height on the myocardium, and the vascular pedicle width will be normal. The vasculature will be normal. And this creates a relatively straightening of the upper border of the myocardium and a bulging of the inferior border, which is referred to as a water bottle shaped heart, or some people refer to as a beaker sign or Erlenmeyer flask sign. Two signs that you need to keep in mind are reflective of pericardial effusion or cardiomyopathy. On the lateral examination, we'll actually see separation of the black epicardial fat stripe from the black retrosternal fat stripe by the intervening layer of white fluid, which is referred to as a fat pad sign. I actually like to call this the Oreo cookie sign because I like Oreos. Um, but the black cookie layer here represents the black epicardial fat stripe. This black cookie layer represents the retrosternal fat stripe. And the intervening fluffy stuff is your pericardial effusion. And on the sagittal reconstruction, we can actually send the fluid enveloping the myocardium here, the black epicardial fat stripe, the black retrosternal fat stripe, and the intervening layer of pericardial fluid. So I hope this brief tour of the heart and pericardium and conventional radiography was helpful to you as it lays down the foundation and groundwork for recognizing disease and pathology on cross-sectional living studies. Thank you, Carolyn.